said I'm going on seeking to transcend the boundaries of language and connect with your essence. We acknowledge the challenges that surround us, the conflicts that grip our world. In the war-torn war lands of Ukraine and Russia, Israel, Hamas, and Palestine, and other nations troubled in conflict, we pray for peace to prevail, for understanding and empathy to replace hostility. May the flames of discord be extinguished and compassion ignite the hearts of all involved, leading them towards reconciliation and harmony. We ask that you guide us towards a just and lasting peace. Coming closer to home, we find ourselves grappling with the erosion of democratic values, the erosion of trust in public officials, we pray for the integrity to be restored within those who hold positions of power. 
May they recognize the immense responsibility entrusted to them using their authority for the betterment of society and protection of the common good of all. Divine Source, we acknowledge that within our, within our own personal lives, we too face challenges and struggles. We humbly ask for your intervention, for the blessings of your word to guide us and heal us. Grant us the strength and clarity to navigate the complexities of our own existence and provide us with the wisdom to discern right from wrong. In this season of thanks and giving, we recognize the immense power of gratitude. We are grateful for another opportunity to come together and to share in the abundance we have received from you to be agents of positive change, transcending our circumstances and allowing us to find joy even in the midst of our trials. And in closing, may your love and grace fill our hearts, inspiring us to be vessels of your peace and compassion. May our prayers be heard as we strive to create a world where thanks and giving are not mere words, but transformative actions that lifts us up and unites us all. Amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. In here, out there, and around the world, we welcome you to Grace Congregational Church. Amen. Amen. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And we have a little puppy called Gigi, and I say, be Gigi glad in the morning. She just waking up and wagging her tail and just excited as she could be about a new day. And I think every day I look at her, and that's the way we ought to greet the day and greet each other. Amen? Amen. Amen. It is the season of grace and gratitude. And so we are in a spirit of grace and gratitude this week and thanksgiving because we have received much. And to much is given, much is expected. And you can't give unless you have been already given. And we know that we have already received. And so we are filled with grace and gratitude this week. And this is the week that we just say thank you, thank you. And for some of you folks who say, I can't pray, just say thank you. It's a prayer. That's a prayer all by itself. Thank you. So grace and gratitude and grace this week. We continue to pray every day because we know that God said in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, I would heal their land. And we know there is much healing in the land today that is needed. You know, I think of the nonviolent movement that helped move this country to a new civil rights movement. And what caused us to be where we are today is because we did it with nonviolence. Because if you do violence, you only get violence, right? Dr. King said, you can't snuff out hate with hate. You can only snuff out hate with love. And you can't snuff out violence with violence. And so even Gandhi, who he learned much from, but they all learned it from Jesus, amen, about nonviolence. And he said it's, it's love force, it's the Satahira, if I can pronounce that correctly. But the love force, the soul force, is the only force that we should have towards one another. And so as Dr. King had said, the choice today is no longer between violence and nonviolence. It's either nonviolence or non-existence. And we certainly see that today, where we are almost annihilating a group of people and we can't even imagine the heart breaking situations for families and mothers and children that are being killed. There's no justification, amen? And so as the world calls for ceasefire and some afraid to say those words, we're not afraid to say it in church because when Jesus said, I want you to pray the Our Father, he meant you and I are brothers and sisters. I don't care what you believe, I don't care what you look like, you're still my brother and you're still my sister. 
and our lives are equally valuable. And because of that, we know that what's going on in the world today is wrong. And we are connected to one another. That if you are hurting, I'm hurting. We can't just separate ourselves and say, well, that's just over there. No, we're all hurting. Those are our children that are being killed. And so as we saw with COVID and we cite with world, world climate control and all of that going on today, we're all connected. We can't just say, let's hurt a part of the world and we're not hurting over here. So our prayer today is that we find the unity, the peace, the love, the brothership and the fathership and the sonship and all the togetherness that we can have once again. And that's why I love you when you come and you sing. My mother used to sing, sing for the United Nations and they would go around the world and sing for peace because singing brings us together, you know? And sometimes if you're even in a bad mood, just sing a song and you feel better after that song is all over. You forgot what mood you were in, amen? Amen. So I love that song. We were with Vi um, this week and uh, they had a little, a young lady sing, um, don't let anybody tell you you're not beautiful, right? Because you are connected to my soul. I love that song. And when a, a little young lady sang that, I wish we could just take you all over the world and just sing that song to people. I mean, if you get, got to Israel and said, don't let anyone tell you you're less than beautiful, go to Palestine and sing that song and let people know they're not anything less than beautiful because I think that would change the world if you would just take that song and go around the world with it. So I'm so grateful that Wednesday Night Sings is here and they are bringing peace and love and hope, amen? Amen. We have a course on developing respectful discourse that we work with SAJ, a uh, synagogue on the Upper West Side, 86th Street, and it's great that uh, a synagogue we would sit with Jewish folks and Jewish folks would come with us. I would preach at a synagogue and the rabbi would come and preach here. And we have spent time, we've had dinner together, we've traveled together, we're friends together. And so now when there's tension in the air, we can say, we're still friends. We're still friends. So that's important. So developing respectful discourse, we've got people who completely disagree with us and yet we love them. In fact, I just told, we got a box of Idaho potatoes back there. Somebody from Idaho sent us a box of potatoes because he's been online with us for four years now. B completely believes things different than us, but he loves us as a family, and we are family, amen? And that's how life should be. Normally we have, after Sunday, we have, we have sermon talk back. It is suspended for the rest of the year, amen? So we, <laughs> amen. <laughs> so, so we can just enjoy family every Wednesday night from now on until the end of the year, and we'll resume come January. Amen. <laughs> Don't forget Giving Tuesday, okay? Don't spend it all on Black Friday and Cyber Monday, and then you get to Giving Tuesday, you're like, I ain't got no more. <laughs> save it. Actually, you should try to save most of it for your Giving Tuesday, not just to churches, but to organizations, charitable and otherwise, that are helping our communities. And so I believe it's important. You know, when the Bible says give 10%, I say that's just starting. That's where you start from, and then the rest you give. Because God is saying, I'll, I'll let you keep 90%. I like that partner, right? I'm giving you, nine, keep 90%, but give back 10%. Give away, because it makes the giver who is your God, the generous God, right? He said, God so loved the world that he gave you what? His only begotten son. He gave you everything. And so in order to return and just cap that, I think we've messed folks up. We tell people, you know, we got this building fund you gotta give to and this. No, we ought to teach our people to be generous. Just generous. I like where Moses said, stop giving. I don't even know where to put the stuff you guys are giving me. I want, I want a pastor to get up on one Sunday morning and say, guys, stop giving. We've, you've given too much. I don't even know where to do, what to do with all that you've given. Can you imagine a church like that? And that's where we ought to be, amen? Amen. Those of you, we, I see a lot of kids here. We have a skiing program, learning six and up. 
So, not the seasoned citizens, amen? I don't want you on the slopes. I don't want you on the slopes. But six and up, I want on the slopes. I tell you, I learned when a kid, I had these three um, young folks that lived near me, and they used to go skiing, and they took me skiing with them. And I learned when I was young. And it was a great adventure just to be out there and to learn. And I tell you now, when the kids are young, that's when it's time to learn. You ain't got far to fall, amen? <laughs> so th that's when you learn. So please, we have a few kids. We have about three or four. I'd love to get a busload of kids and just take them out and teach them how to ski, give them the equipment, all that they need to know, the instruction. It's a three-year program, and it really helps them enjoy the outdoors. So. If there's anybody in the group that I would say, see Barbara, how's that? You all know Barbara Fennell, our BFF, Barbara Fennell. You will know, know her, amen? And we are certainly celebrating Native American Heritage Month. You know, these are the folks who helped the pilgrims acclimate in the climate, gave them food, showed them how to hunt and all that. And unfortunately, we turned around and took their land killed them, gave them disease, and all kinds of things. So we're just now, if you've seen the new movie that came out, uh, Killing a, a Sunflower? Flower Moon, thank you. It's three hours, but just what we did to the people of this country that we found that here. So we're, we're, I, we're giving honor to those Native Americans, and certainly this is the week to say thank you to those who were here and lived here and showed us how to live. Amen. We have a commercial on FM Praise. If you haven't heard that station, it's a beautiful gospel station uh, run by Deacon Deborah's, is it daughter, right? Daughter and her son-in-law. So we have a commercial on there, but fmpraise.com if you want to get your gospel on. Amen. Fan Praise. What did I say? Family? Fan Praise. And this beautiful family we had dinner with last night. Reverend Tim is going to be our preacher today. And he's here with his lovely wife, Danielle. They're from Boise, Idaho. Amen. <laughs> and their three beautiful children, I'm going to mess this up, Jeremiah. Jeremiah was with us for a month a couple years ago. He was just a little guy then. And now he's a taller guy, but he's, he's with us. And they have their daughter, Natalie, and their younger son, Caleb, that has joined us today. And so this beautiful family, they came from all the way from Boise, Idaho, and we've stayed in touch. Um, Timothy actually was, was, he is a New Yorker, right? First grade to 10th grade, you were in New York. Um, he is of Puerto Rican and what descent? White. <laughs> White, white. But he has been, he's the national director for InterVarsity and uh, just a heck of a nice guy. But he has also had his PhD and he, um, he's very big in the Nazarene church where his grandfather planted churches from Puerto Rico to New York City. And now he's international and the family has spent time in Singapore and Italy. And so you will hear from somebody who has ministered around the world and finding that all people are people, right? Because there's a Latin phrase that says, there's nothing you feel that I don't feel. And once we realize that human, we connect, amen. So I'll have him come up afterwards and he'll be our speaker and our speaker and sermon for the day. He is part of InterVarsity. Should I let you go through these slides? Okay, I'll let you go through these slides because this is InterVarsity, which he is the national director for, amen. So welcome to Grace Congregational Church. He is no stranger, he's been here before, and he is a good friend, and we spent time and broke bread last night. Amen? Amen. I want to welcome Eastern Star. Lachey, you want to say a few words? We've got some baskets up here. I know. Come on all the way up. <laughs> All the Eastern Stars want to come up? Come on up. We want to, we're grateful for them and the baskets that they have brought here today. Good morning, good morning. I'm usually over there behind those screens, so. <laughs> but um, it's 
So we are from uh, Eureka Grand Chapter, Prince Hall Order of the Eastern Star, State of New York. We are elected Chapter 14. We have one of our brothers, uh, incoming brothers from Adelphic Union Lodge Number 14, our brother lodge. And so what we do for um, the community, and we try to do this every year, is to be able to gift Thanksgiving meals to the underprivileged in the community. And so um, as one of our outreaches, this is what we've done for Grace Church. And um, we're just blessed to be able to have the opportunity to do it. So this is my associate matron, LaTanya. Um, this is Charmaine, one of our past matrons, and another past matron, Janice. So we are um, very pleased to be here and um, just thankful that we could do this for you. So thank you for having us. Amen. So I didn't say this, but there's a sister over here who's part of Beacon Light Chapter um, as well. So she is from Prince Hall as well. So. Amen. Amen. And Agape Love, I just want, they are a group at, at Grace Congregational Church that are sponsoring afterwards a meal. So we have folks coming in, and if you'd love to stay and join us and break bread with us, please do that after service. We will have a beautiful meal set aside for you. Amen? Because communion is not just bread and wine. It was actually a whole dinner. And it's important that we spend time, sit down together, have t meals together. We don't do that anymore, amen? You used to be able to go home and smell the cooking that your mom was doing all day. Now people use microwaves and you smell nothing. <laughs> so we gotta get back to those old days where we just had a meal and sit around the table and talk to one another and love on one another, amen? <laughs> amen. And now I'll bring up none other than Greg Kelly and the Wednesday Night Sings. Don't let anybody tell you you're not beautiful. Amen. Good morning. Can somebody say hallelujah? Can somebody say thank you, Jesus? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I'm glad to be here with my brother, Pastor Nigel, and my new brother from Boise, Idaho, I didn't even know he was a preacher. We was just back there talking, but uh, you know, it's just good to be nice and nice to be nice. So glad that I met your family really quick, you know, quick introduction. But this is the Wednesday Sings Choir. We are from the Mama Foundation for the Arts, where our leader, Miss Vi Higginson, sends her love and her greetings to all of you. And um, she wished that she can be here, but I told her yesterday, and I'm sure Pastor Nigel's been on her case too. Stay home and recuperate. Yeah, she, she's a, a lovely leader that fell down a complete flight of 25 steps and was able to get up and walk away from it. I mean, people, you know, fall down steps and they are, they are goners, but we are grateful to the Lord that God preserved her life in that situation. And she, she walked away with a few bruises, but we're just grateful to God that she is able to be with us in the land of the living at this time and uh, recuperate. And we're going to do these three songs really quickly. And uh, the first song says, Without Faith It's Impossible to Please the Lord. If you're interested in joining our choir, we have our one last rehearsal um, next Wednesday. No, not this Wednesday, the following Wednesday, but we restart Wednesday Sings. It's free, and these guys are singing like amazing, like you would think this is a professional choir, but I don't play when it comes to teaching, so they, they're doing a great job. At the Mama Foundation for the Arts on, at 149 West 126th Street, come out on some Wednesdays and join us. Without faith it's impossible to please the Lord.
All right. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody clap your hands for Jesus. Yeah. That felt good. Hallelujah. We're going to do an old school song. This song says, wade in the water. God's going to trouble the water. Oh 
Come on, clap your hands, everybody. been like uh, there's already been like six sermons this morning so I'll keep it really really short um, no but we're first gonna read from from the word of the Lord numbers 13 and they'll be on the screen I believe I've got it so I'm gonna try and find there we go that's not the right one we're gonna go back to the we're missing the first verses but that's all right. You know, um, I'll just three verses here um, in the beginning, and then we'll pick it up with these verses. So Numbers chapter 13 says, the, the Lord spoke to Moses, send out men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. Send one man from each ancestral tribe, each a chief among them. So Moses sent them out from the Paran desert according to the Lord's command. All the men were leaders among the Israelites. They returned from exploring the land after 40 days. They went directly to Moses, Aaron, and the entire Israelite community in the Paran Desert at Kadash. They brought back a report to them and to the entire community and showed them the land's fruit. Then they gave their report. We entered, to the, we entered the land to which you sent us. It's actually full of milk and honey, and this is its fruit. There are, however, powerful people who live in the land. The cities have huge fortifications, and we even saw the descendants of the Anakites there. The Amalekites live in the land of the arid southern plain. The Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites live in the mountains, and the Canaanites live by the sea along the Jordan. Now Caleb calmed the people, silenced the people before Moses and said, we must go up and take possession of it because we are more than able to do it. So we're a little out of sync, and that's okay. This is the word of the Lord um, for the people of God. Amen? So, yeah, I was introduced, and I'm going to just kind of hop over to that picture real quick. Sorry about this if we, like, move through. So um, just to pick up just a little bit, yeah, I'm so grateful to be back. 2019, I was here with Jeremiah for four weeks. Thank you. Those four weeks, I stood here with a hanky because I was sweating like crazy, but it was beautiful. It was one of the hottest summers in New York City. I grew up in New York City, so like, like what was shared, you know, my mom's a four foot 11 Puerto Rican from Puerto Rico, moved to the city, lived in Manhattan. My dad's a six foot one white dude from Long Island, Valley Stream. This is what you get, <laughs> right? You get a much more prettier, prettier looking one than my sister who so but anyways yeah so this is what you get but um, I, I grew up here and then then God started we, we moved to Michigan I finished up high school but then God started leading me all over the world and I actually did university in Idaho and promised God I would never ever go back to that state and now I'm living there with my family after about eight oh, we're, we're just approaching eight years just over seven years living there and, um, but in between there, I, like has been mentioned, I have three beautiful, amazing children, 17, 15, and 13. Jeremiah is now 15. He was 10 when we were here, or 11, what it was, something like that. And, 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 um, and they're full-on teenagers. You can meet them later. But, um, and so, been married to my wonderful wife for 22 years, and we've lived in Italy and in Singapore and the country of Alabama. And you're with me. Okay, there we are deep south, below, below the 10, which is where Natalie was born, and we ser we've been serving the Lord all over the world. And now I get to serve the Lord through an organization known as, as, as InterVarsity, and it's somewhere there. We'll just, we'll just leave it here. And, um, and I am grateful to be serving the Lord again with college students. And so we work with 700 universities throughout the U.S., several of them in the, in the urban and metro area here. Um, but also where I live, at Boise State University. And so I, I get to be um, what is known as the National Director for Church Engagement and Resourcing. So I get to serve the bride ecumenically throughout the country, um, inviting them into relationship with the next 
generation, with young emerging adults which are our leaders of tomorrow. And so, t so we have this calling at InterVarsity. We, we want to invite young emerging adults into real hope. Real hope isn't an idea, it's not a philosophy, it's not even a theology, it's a person, Jesus. And that is real hope for us. And so I wanna share about hope. And what, what do we get preoccupied in our lives with? Is it hope or is it something else? See, the reality is, and we know it, it's been, it was prayed about earlier, it's been talked about all day today, and which is a beautiful thing. We live in a world where there is pain and there is death, and there is sorrow and there is darkness. There is war and there is famine. We live in a, in a, in a world with, which seems to be growing violence, diseases, disasters, crisis, economic and family and all sorts. And our campuses, they, these students face the same things, but also a growing crisis on our campus. Two major crises right now are homelessness and hunger. And of course, anxiety is at an all-time high in this generation. But we also live I believe in a world where there is healing and there is life and there is joy and we sung about it this morning there is hope and there is faith and this exists they exist simultaneously we live in a world where life and death and wounds and wonders grief and we celebrate gratitude they kiss each other at nearly every moment of every day we should neither avoid nor ignore this reality that we, but, but I believe Jesus has called us to live into that tension, into the, into the both and of this world differently than what the world tells us. One that neither is apathetic nor hysterical. One that is neither controlled by fear nor negates fear. One that not only empathizes with, with others, but is compassionate toward others. So how do we live faithfully or fully or flourishingly in such tension? I see, I believe in this God that continues to reveal God's self. See, so if we walk through scripture just really quickly, not the entire, but as much as we can. Genesis 1, 1, right? Oh, I begin in the very, very beginning. So in the beginning, God, God reveals God's self as the beginning. And then the next word is in the beginning, God created. God reveals God's self as creator. And then if we move on just into chapter two, we see that God does not, does not invade them. He says, where are you? And then he, God reveals God's self as a seamstress. God sews the garments together for Adam and Eve. See, and on and on, we see this God that reveals God's self as a pillar of fire, as a cloud of smoke. In the prophets, the prophets say this, draw near and hear the word of the Lord. God reveals God's self through the proclamation of the word, hearing from, uh, from, the, Lord, from the word, from God. And then if, if we move on into the New Testament, ultimately we see the most beautiful thing that ever happens. God reveals God's self as flesh, as Jesus, ultimately as flesh, as one of us. But it doesn't end there. See, Jesus sends this people known as the church in the spirit. And so God is calling us to reveal God's self to the world. See, we have a power beyond ourselves to reveal hope, the spirit in us. And I believe this text in, in the 13th century BC may give us a little bit different perspective. But I think we need to look at our own perspective. It's believed that that one's perspective on life or posture can also determine one's actions. We're all becoming something. We're in the art of becoming. We're becoming, what we are becoming is often determined by what we love or hope in the most. What we hope for is more than, more than wishful thinking or something. See, hope, hope is bigger than that. Hope looks at both the present and the future. So as Christians, as ones called by Jesus, we, we look at, at something beyond ourselves as a, a goal or an end, right? And, 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 and we call that hope, or do we look at it differently then? But if we look at it ho as hope, hope changes how we live in the present, how we act, and what we hold too tightly and what we hold too loosely. So we might ask ourselves, what sort of hope do we see in the future? Or do we see any hope, really? Man, it's a dark world we live in. Do we see redemption or do we see destruction? Do we hope that, that in a God who redeems all of creation and all of humanity? Or we just, do we just think that the world is going to hell in a handbasket? Do I hope, see we got a new puppy too in our house, right? So, so, so uh, we have a French, Frenchy bulldog and this, this dog is into everything and this dog wants to do what it wants to do, right? And it wants to do-do in the front room. 
you're with me, right? So yeah, so do I hope that my dog will stop pooping in the front room or do I do something about it? See, what we hope in for, either big or small, shapes how we live in our everyday, right now. Numbers 13, so here we're going to jump in the text. There were 10 spies that, that Moses sends out, and they come back with a, with a certain posture and perspective on, on what they experienced. These very strong and capable, the elite of the elite among the men there were sent out, and they come back after their 250-mile journey, and they say the, man, the land is amazing. It's flowing with milk and honey, which means resources. It has what we need. It's beautiful. They even bring back some fig for Moses. Try this. It tastes so good. But the people there are powerful. They live there. They, they devour its residents. There's giants there, the Amicalites, the Anakites. And these cities, they have huge walls. So basically, I think like these 10 spies, they kind of they summarize in this phrase. Our enemies there are so big. They're so big, we can't possibly fight them. It seems like these 10 spies, they're preoccupied with the size of their struggle. Have you ever been there? I mean, I'm there like almost every day. <laughs> the size of the struggle with my family, the size of the struggle with my work, the size of the struggle with, so I work with this organization with InterVarsity, right? And we are missionaries. We have to raise all of our support. We have to work with, a, with 700 universities. Um, there's 20 million college students on on 2,500 campuses. That is a huge number. So if we added all of Connecticut, all of New York, and all of New Jersey, that's the population, 20 million. Add in faculty and staff, that's another 8 million. So 28 million. There is no way that a small organization like InnoVarsity is going to reach 2,500 people. Or, sorry, 20 million people on 2,500 campuses. That struggle is huge. So I want to share a story about one student, Tori. So Tori came to the UNC Wilmington, University of North Carolina Wilmington. She, she um, encountered a space that was safe and allowed her to navigate faith and life. And she came to know real hope. She came to say yes to Jesus. That changed her life. And so she wanted to, to continue the ministry there. But there was a problem. COVID hit. It crushed the the chapter. There was no one that came back. And so there was this rebuilding time that had to take place. So Tori knew that in order to give her full attention to this, this opportunity, she needed to begin to pray. And so she prayed. But she began to thinking, I'm, I'm new in Wilmington. I don't know anybody. And so she began to pray for somebody, just anybody out there, anybody out there that could help her. I'm, I'm backed in the corner, she said. I don't know how I'm going to do this. And so she began praying. And God answered Tori's prayers through a girl named Emma. So Emma calls Tori and finds out that Tori is wanting to plant at this school. And together, Emma and Tori, they connect with other people on the campus. They connect with churches in the area. They begin to make themselves available. And post-COVID, there is a successful space for kids to navigate faith and life from a Christian perspective now on that campus. It began with one... It began with one girl's prayer. One girl's hope that something could happen. So I want to share one more story. This girl named Mika. This, this girl, this young Latina is from, it, it went to college in, in Utah. And after that, she, she also, she had, came from no faith background, no, no faith at all. She claimed no faith and was introduced to some friends in InterVarsity on, on the campus in which she was attending and began to hang out in that space. And it was a safe space where she could explore her questions and what she wanted to do with life and what faith even meant. And she began to, she, she came to a place where she said yes to real hope. Hope that there was something actually beyond college and there was something for her. And, and she got... She got this itch, she says, to then be able to provide such a space for other students. And yet that was leading her to a, a state she had never been to before called Idaho. And so in Twin Falls, we on our side have been praying in Boise, Idaho, that someone would come and help us plant it at a community college, a two-year college in Twin Falls, which had no space for any students to navigate faith and life from a Christian perspective. And Mika calls our campus minister and says, hey, I think God's calling me to Twin Falls. Is there anything there? And now Mika is our campus minister in Twin Falls, Idaho, 
and there are 20 students attending this small group. See, see, we all face, and you know it, and I, we all face struggles and forces in our lives that are out of our control. Some within our control, but they're, they're, they're from work to family to, to, to loss of work to, to diseases. There's things that, that happen to us and, and, and that are in our lives, systemic injustices and natural disasters that are out of our control that happen and often our posture becomes it becomes like these 10 spies those giants are just too big they're too much the walls are too huge and so we cling to fear and to worry and to anxiety and hear me fear and worry and anxiety are real very very real and so we begin to ask ourselves, how can we actually move forward when there are these walls? How can we face these giants even if we wanted to? Now, I am in no way saying that some of these giants we face in our lives are slayable. There are some that aren't. As Christians, we must stand up to injustice, especially ones happening within our own sphere of influence, in, a, in our families and in our communities. Yet I know not all of these forces, they, I know from personal experience in my family, they, some of these forces will not disappear if one just stops worrying. That is not what I'm saying. See, some diseases never go away. They only take away. Yet, in light of the New Testament, and in particular, the God that became flesh, that revealed flesh to us, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and Jesus' active call to peacemaking, I am in no way believing that the point of this story in Numbers 13 is to take. <laughs> to take land or people or anything by force. But I do believe there is a calling in this text to trust the God who overcomes and overcomes any giant. And for us then to live, maybe in the words of Paul, in faith, in hope, and in love. And the greatest of these being love. But I believe that begins with a posture shift. It focuses on a different goal. And so I wanna look at the same number, 20 million. All right, let's be crazy here for a moment. Just imagine 10,000 of these students saying yes to real hope. All right, let's, let's imagine 1 million saying yes to real hope. Not negating their fear or their worry, but putting that into the God who reveals that I am with you. Imagine 10 million, let's say half of these young emerging adults, and they enter into the workforce and into the world and into churches and into the life of the marketplace. Imagine what would change with a people that have this hope in a God that is love. The posture of the 10 spies affected their entire perspective of life and faith. They were pre preoccupied with the size of the struggle. And there was a text after that I didn't read, but I, wanna, I want you to hear this verse. See this, they were preoccupied with the size of the struggle and it led to a distorted image of themselves and of others. I call it the grasshopper syndrome. See verse 33, which I didn't read, says this. We saw ourselves as grasshoppers and we looked the same to them. This is what those 10 spies said to Moses. These 10 spies believed they were a small nation, not big enough. They were like grasshoppers, not strong enough. They were, they were a people of limited resources. They were homeless and wandering in the desert and had little weapons. So fear took over them and they believed that the battle was up to them and their power and their resources. Instead of trusting in a God who had ultimate power and unlimited resources. These 10 spies forgot something very, very important. They were children, and not only children, but beautiful, beloved children of Yahweh. In turn, they grasped onto a misplaced identity, this grasshopper identity, and believed in a distorted image of themselves. We do this too, I think. I, well, I do this. I'm not big enough. I mean, look at me. My dad's six one, my mom's four eleven, remember? I'm not smart enough. I'm not thin enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not athletic enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not Latino enough. 
It's true, we all face identity issues in life. Whether it's in middle school and we're wondering about our body, or if it's in college and we're wondering what to do with our bodies, <laughs> or if it's post that and wondering how we navigate our bodies in a world, what we do and how we do it. We all face identity issues. And then I think oftentimes we buy into this distorted image and it's a lie. A lie that we say to ourselves, oh, you're just a grasshopper. And this isn't just students that I work with or in my own self, but it's in churches too. We're not a big enough church. We're not a financial enough church. We're not a strong enough church. We we don't really have anything to offer. And then this causes, I believe, us, not just the church, but I've seen it in the church, it causes us to dehumanize others. And we buy into the lie that they're just grasshoppers too. And they're not good enough. And they're not smart enough. And they're not enough. And we forget. Like the Israelites, we forget who we are, or better yet, whose we are. See, we are more than what we tell ourselves. We are more than what the world tells us. We, we are created in the image of God, the imago dei. We are, we are children of Yahweh, not just children. We are beautiful, beloved children. All of us and all of us. <laughs> but there were two other spies, and I'll wrap it up with this. There were two other spies. There was Caleb and Joshua, right? There was 12 that were sent out. And Caleb, he seemed to have this ability to, to, to speak well. He silences the entire crowd, all of the nation of Israel there. He seemed to have this different faith, a faith in something that these 10 didn't have. And Caleb calmed the people before, he, before Moses and he said this, we must go up and take possession of it because we are more than able to do it. See, this young man had a different perspective and posture. No matter, no matter what was ahead, the giants, the walls, he saw the same thing these other 10 saw, right? But Caleb believed in a God that was bigger than any giant. He believed even more than that. He believed that they were more than able in God's power. He believed that God was not limited, that God was unlimited. Maybe he believed this. The 10 spies said, our enemies are so big we can't possibly fight them. Maybe, Caleb said, our enemies are so big we can't miss them. <laughs> See, Caleb chose a different posture. He chose to trust. He chose to hope. He looked at this number and he wasn't preoccupied by the size of the struggle. He was preoccupied by the hope that could happen with 20 million. He, he remembered he was a child of Yahweh and he tried to convince the rest that they were too. See, we are all God's dearly loved children, a God that never abandons us. We sometimes get the message wrong, absolutely, just like they did. <laughs> and how to go about it. But no matter how many times we get it wrong, God never leaves us. We have a peace that passes understanding, and we know this especially revealed in the God who was flesh, who could have said anything after the resurrection, and his first words to all of us, not just the disciples then, were peace, be with you. And I believe this peace gives us a different posture of navigating our lives. And so I want to leave you with the words of Paul on a way in which we can begin to be preoccupied with hope. If anything is excellent, admirable, focus your thoughts on these things, all that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise, practice, and can I say this, and remember, the God of peace will be with you. Amen? Amen. Good morning, Grace.
rejoice He wraps Himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at His voice Trembles at His voice How great is our God Sing it with me in our hearts for all that you have done for us and how can we repay you when you have given us everything and sacrificed all for us and so Lord God it is only with a heart of thanksgiving that we give back to you and so God bless you God bless you in your giving amen Just wanna pray
just want to praise you forever and ever and ever for all you've done for me. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing. Just wanna praise you forever and ever and ever for all you've done for me. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing. Able to stand, please stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father. Father God, we lift these gifts to you. No other help we know. We thank you that you have created the stars, the moon and the sun and the sky. But you have created each and every one of us in your image. So Lord God, let us live into that image fearfully and wonderfully made so that we know that we are loved beyond our imagination from the God of heaven who created you just the way you are. So Lord God, give us that generous heart so that we can be a giver just like you on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, I am so grateful here for today, and we just had just a spectacular, spectacular church day. Amen. I thank you, Wednesday Night Sings, for bringing your, not just your voices, but your heart and your soul that changes everything and your spirit. So thank you, Wednesday Night Sings, for who you are and, and being here. Amen. For that Puerto Rican white guy, I just love him. And I just thank him for our friendship. And he's kept in touch over all these years. And for his beautiful family who has come from Boise, Idaho. Our prayers are that when you go back, you will feel surrounded by our love and our hope in Jesus for you and for the 28 million lives that you will continue to touch across America and across this world. In Jesus' name, we pray for the work that you do. Amen. Amen. To the Eastern Star, we thank you for coming and blessing us and giving. We want you to go back and just be blessed with your families and loved ones and know that all that you do is for the grace and for the love of God. Amen. And now I am standing in a dangerous place between you and food. <laughs> but I see my, a deacon is, has a hand up. Deacon Deborah. Ah. Amen. Amen. Celebrating our 100th. Thank you, Journal Committee, for doing that. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. 
May the grace of God and the sweetest communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide in every household of faith now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Grace Church said amen. amen. Go and serve the Lord. Happy Thanksgiving. Amen. them? Okay. 